to everyone um, for being here. And on a positive note, before I uh, speak of those who couldn't join us, just again, how thrilled we are that you have this on your schedule and you're committing to this process. As members of this community, you're playing an important role. I know Rustin will speak more to that. But on the side note of who was not able to join us tonight, Allison Warner was not able to come, Jim Scott, Sarah Duffy Clinton, and Ed Holmes. So we will be sure to be in touch with them. And um, if anybody wants to join me in outreach to members who weren't here, it could be kind of a fun way to recap what we did. Um, I always welcome your participation. And I'll give this back to you, Rustin. Great, thank you, Matthew. Uh, well, I'd like to echo the enthusiasm that Matthew is bringing to this conversation. Thank you uh, for what you have committed to for your communities here. We are very, very excited. Uh, this is gonna be a very, very productive meeting. And I can say that because of the amount of work uh, that's been done and the importance of engaging all of you as the steering committee in discussion. Uh, this, is a, this is not a lecture, this is a, a great chance to set aside enough time to make sure everyone has a chance to share their thoughts, uh, ask the questions that they have. We've posed some questions on our agenda that we will uh, get to at the end of each of these segments of, of presentation, because we really wanna make sure that you're engaged. Uh, that's steering committee needs to steer and you need to hold all the cards in order to do that. And our job is to make sure you're holding them. We sent the information out to you uh, end of last week, and uh, there's a lot of information in there. We're certainly not going to go page by page, but we are going to get through all of that. And at the end of the day, uh, with a, a good conversation, we'll have very clear steps moving forward uh, to the next uh, phase and the next presentation. Uh, again, I'm Rustin Hall. I'm with ALSC. I'd like to introduce my teammates. Just in the spirit of saving time, I'm just going to introduce them to you. Uh, and then you'll see them uh, pop up as we get through the rest of this presentation. Uh, always my right hand man is Drew Leeper. He's the man behind the curtain. He'll be operating the, the slide deck tonight. Also watching for uh, any hand raises, any uh, questions that might show up in the chat. Um, please feel free to ask your questions and, and, and engage yourself in this, uh, actually immerse yourself in this because that's the level of uh, participation that we're really hoping for, striving for. Uh, a lot of work's been done, and we want to make sure you're understanding that. We also have Ken Ballard with Ballard King. Uh, Ken has, uh, uh, again, uh, been a partner uh, of ours for years now, working on feasibility studies, and he's been really working very hard on the outreach portion of this in the focus groups, the uh, key stakeholder meetings, uh, all these uh, more focused outreach uh, components. And he'll be going through some of the results of that as well as market analysis tonight. We also have Michael Dean with DH. Uh, Michael is our public outreach uh, social media expert. We're gonna share some of the, the work that he's accomplished, uh, show you a quick video and, and just some of the images of some of the products that he's put out there to make sure that we have touched as many people as is reasonable uh, in a study like this. And uh, we'll share some of those numbers with you as well. We have Chad Heimbigner. Chad is with Kaufman Engineers. He's a civil engineer. And as we've been taking a look and a little deeper dive into some of the available properties that are out there, uh, Chad's work has been to really get into the weeds quite literally in terms of looking at these sites, understanding what some of the hidden costs might be, what some of the infrastructure is that's available, those kinds of things. And then finally, she's not on the call yet, but about seven o'clock or so, uh, Kate Roosevelt, with Campbell and Company is going to join us just to uh, primarily introduce herself, discuss her role, and uh, ask you a question or two uh, as she starts up on uh, looking at funding options, uh, which is a, as you already would understand, a very significant piece of a feasibility study. And we've held her off to this point until we understood exactly what, uh, uh, what it was that we were trying to build and sell, and uh, then she uh, takes it from there. So with that, those are our introductions. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and kick right into our uh, agenda here. Our meeting objectives are very straightforward. Uh, we have an outreach market and demographic analysis that we wanna share with you and get your feedback on. Initial proposed facility program document process and values decisions. The, the key component there is values. We want to understand what you value in terms of what we are recommending on this program uh, summary sheet that we have compiled. We're gonna go through how we've come up with those things, 
but we really want to understand the community values through your eyes. And that's why we've asked some of the questions in the agenda here. And we'll have some really good, good dialogue on that. Uh, the project funding introduction, as I mentioned before, and then uh, a site analysis uh, funding and discussion as well. So that's our, that's our basic uh, agenda. Uh, and with that, we're gonna go ahead and kick into item number two here. Uh, we wanted to bring you up to speed on where we are. I'm gonna go through this very quickly because I don't wanna be preaching tonight. I wanna be listening uh, more than speaking. Uh, we do have a diagram that we sent out. I wanna to touch on that one really quickly just to illustrate the point of where we are in our study. So you can see where this critical feedback is fitting in. This is steering committee number three, meeting number three. We'll have one more meeting after this one. But this is the, this is the, the camel hump in terms of the, the critical nature of putting the meat on the bones of what a facility might be like. And uh, when you look at this diagram, we've broken it into the basic steps outreach gathering of information, which we have basically uh, completed at this point. The process findings and programming is what we've been working hard on. And uh, we are still in process on this as you look at some of those specific details, um, the revenues versus the costs, some of the, uh, the business planning that is still to come. Uh, but you can see on here down under the gather feedback, that's where steering committee number three comes in because we're still collecting your feedback at this point. Uh, we're preparing ourselves for the next virtual public workshop, which will happen on April 20th. We're really looking forward to that one. And there'll be some work done between obviously this meeting and that one to really get the community jazzed up about this. Uh, we've been listening intently for months and we've put together a package here that we really hope is gonna get people very, very excited and engaged in this and getting the mindset of this is starting to, to feel real. This is starting to get exciting. What do we need to do to make this happen? Uh, and those are the, the, the goals that we're after with that. So Drew, if you slide on down a little further, uh, once we've got that uh, feedback uh, gathered up there, we then really are truly testing the feasibility. We've got a, a business plan. We've got a funding option stack that we've been studying, which really all of these components line up to the basic fundamental question of this, which is, is this feasible? And that gets answered towards the end. It's, to be honest with you, it's looking great. Uh, things are, are looking very good. We have a lot of funding option study to do, however. So we need to make sure that uh, that process is going well and that it's fully informed. And that's what you're gonna hear about from Kate today. She's uh, just, that's her expertise. That's why she's on our team. And then once we have all of that, we're gonna do a final presentation, a final report. And, uh, that moves to city council for further action. And with any luck at all, uh, it kicks you to the next, next stage of developing the, the project, which is on another diagram uh, that we put, put together previously showing the overall package. So, so that's really the, uh, the basics on the, uh, the, uh, the, the process, basically. It's somewhat complex, but that's where we are in this. And uh, we're excited for what we've accomplished. Uh, why? was there such a gap between steering committee meeting number two and this one? Uh, part of that was we have been listening very carefully to you. And one of the things that you ask us for is to make sure our outreach was effective, that we had, again, what's reasonable in terms of reaching as many people, including the, you know, the underrepresented. And let's make sure we can firmly check that box and say, yes, we have done what is reasonable for outreach and collection of data. And we believe that we have, and we'll drill into that here in a little, little bit more in a minute here. Uh, what's remaining then is, as I had spoken to earlier, is after today's meeting, we're going to come out of this with any luck at all with a, a, a confirmation of the, the program, which is fundamental to the rest of the study. It helps us finalized site analysis. It helps us with the funding, helps us understand what this facility will cost to build and to operate and to maintain. And again, it's what's going to get people excited about this. It puts sizzle on the stake, so to speak, that says this is no longer just a study. This is becoming real. And let's get excited and figure out how we can support it and educate everyone in that, that process. So with all of that, uh, under item number two uh, F, we posed a question to you. Uh, so this is your opportunity to immerse yourself in our conversation here. 
The question was what program, excuse me, what project goals have been achieved and which remain? And I know that's a, that's, that's a big question, but I want to start there at kind of that 30,000 foot level and get some feedback and hear from uh, as many of you as we can uh, a lot time for here because we're going to keep moving. But uh, who's got the first response to that question? Not everyone speak at once now. <laughs> yeah, if you, you know, uh, uh, go ahead, Russ, and I'm going to jump in to assist you a little bit. Tell you two important things. One, Miss Linda Johnson is uh, joined us. She's using my FaceTime account, so you might wonder why is he holding up a phone? That's so that Linda can join in. Okay, great. So we're all getting there together. Um, and then my second point is is you asked what goals remain. And I wanted to remember those who couldn't be here tonight. Um, they, like everyone on the steering committee came up with some outcomes they were interested in pursuing. And I don't wanna forget there. So there are um, some of the things they were looking for and I won't give you their names, but for those who couldn't be here, one had raised that there be diversity of uh, participation involved in this study. So what are the remaining goals? You know, that they would be asking for a role of diversity um, a second outcome or desire was teamwork. So you, you could ask a question about how people are working together across either the cities or departments. Um, solution oriented, that was another outcome that some of you have asked for, bringing the communities together. And then finally, intentional work. And I know those may not translate exactly to remaining goals, but they do speak to outcomes. And I wanna remind the steering committee uh, to think on what you really care about seeing come out of this process as you as he asked you that question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the, 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 the details on that, Matthew. That's very, very helpful. Uh, but it is a, still an important question and uh, we'd love to hear any further thoughts that you have uh, before we move on. So uh, this is Brock. Can you hear yes, me? Brock? Yeah. So I from looking over what the information was, it looks like uh, we've done quite a bit in outreach. So, that, I mean, that's a goal that we had was to expand that outreach. And I think, I think we've, it looks like that's been done. Um, studies on the locations, I think uh, from the information that I saw, it looks like that has been pretty thorough. And um, it looks like we've come up with a, a best, best case scenario. So that's good. And the hierarchy of interest. It seems like um, throughout all these um, polls and uh, interviews and things like that, we've come up with a, a good set of, you know, these are what people are looking for. And it seems like it, it uh, supports, you know, area-wide, statewide, and nationwide in, as far as the interest in, in what we see here. So I think we're uh, going the right direction and, and the data seems to support that. So I think, I think, I think the goals are being achieved, yeah. Excellent, thank you. And then we have Christina with her hand up and then Laura, um, we'll do them in alphabetical order. Oh, thank you. Um, well, Brock, thank you for eloquently laying that out. Um, he took a lot of the words out of my mouth. I think we have established a need and we've refined it and we've sifted through. Um, I do wonder, did we slightly pointed in the direction of an aquatic center more uh, than we wanted to, um, you know, very specific towards an aquatic center? Uh, or did we want it to know more from the public as far as what, what else they wanted? Because I, I did notice that there was, there was you know, the, the two things that came up were an aquatic, a pool and a rock climbing wall from my, from my you know, looking through it. Um, so I would like to know if that was um, not biased at all. Um, the location, if we could, again, I know we, we haven't met for a long time. We've done a lot of, um, we've done a lot of minimalizing. And if we found that location, maybe we can reiterate, reiterate that location. Location, But as far as diversity, um, I know we, and I don't know how much this, how helpful this can be, but you know, we do have a new commission that really is focused on that in Covington. And I do wonder if there's any way they could have a say or do their own outreach. Well, 
not their own outreach, but if they if they have an opinion about about this new community center, because, I mean, this is the goal, right? We we didn't just establish the commission for them to do nothing, but we have such a need for that. And if that is one of the goals, and um, just even a point that somebody you know put out there, if there's anything that they can do. Um, but otherwise, uh, I love where this commission, or I'm sorry, where the steering committee is going, and I think we're on target, and I cannot wait to see where we get. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm Laura, and what Brock and Christina said, I feel very similar in many ways. Um, one of the things that I think we have been successful at is starting at the very, very general and now we're drilling down into the more specific, the more specific kind of needs um, in our community. We started with what we kind of all felt might be the correct needs, and now we have data to back some of that up. Um, and it's good to look at, oh yeah, we were all thinking correctly. Like we were kind of on the right track with what we feel like the community needs. Um, and that's good because that means you have a good representation on this committee. Um, the, many of the things that we guessed the community needed now we have data to back up saying like oh that's an actual need um just my thought in regard to the pool as christina brought up this did originally begin um, as a project to replace the aging covington aquatic center so i'm not disappointed to see it be a heavy pool focused um, that pool is going to have to be replaced possibly sooner rather than later. And so um, I don't think anybody wants to see it disappear out of the community. I don't think that's what um, Christina either, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad to see that that is remaining and still there. And so in terms of what needs to be remain, um, what needs to be accomplished still, as you mentioned, funding is a big question mark in my mind. And um, how are we gonna fund this in two communities that have been traditionally resistant to paying more money for things? Um, that's kind of my biggest question mark. And I know that that is on your radar and that we will get there with options. And so I'm very much looking forward to that part of the whole thing. Awesome, thank you very much. Other thoughts? This is Mark personally. Um, you know, my, my thought was that uh, I was impressed with how much public input was actually achieved in what's a, what's a very difficult climate to bring people together in right now. Uh, we would all have, have loved to see maybe some more participation in some of the, uh, the events, but I think um, this group and the, and the principals did a very nice job of actually reaching out and and starting a conversation it's far from done but they got it started that hadn't been started before right. awesome thank you have, yeah uh, you're, you're absolutely right it's uh, it's been a challenge but uh we we uh all together collectively have risen to the challenge and i think have, have uh, accomplished uh the task to date uh in a pretty complete way so uh but thank you for that uh, drew i'm sorry to cut you off oh yeah no that's fine um marita has a her hand up and then we'll follow up by with uh Monty. okay thanks um yeah i wanted to i'll reiterate that I, I really appreciate the amount of work that's been accomplished already um and i have a i guess my i have more of a question um, when I was looking through the materials and I was looking at the, the potential layouts um, for the different sites, um, I was wondering if those, the ratio of the uses was set in stone or if that's still something that needs to be uh, determined. Um, I was a little bit surprised at um, how, how heavy it was on the athletics, which I, is very much needed. I'm not saying we don't need that. We, I know we do, but just the ratio of that to some of the, the more common space that might be used for meetings or um, events and um, classes and that kind of thing. So I wasn't sure if that was something that still needed to be determined or not. Okay. Well, since you, you formed that as a question, uh, what I'm going to do is, is respond by saying we're going to be talking about that very specific point here in just a little while when we're okay. uh, discussing that programming and that process because that's a key 
you, you've really touched on a fundamental question. Uh, that's one of the most difficult parts of, of programming. And when I say programming, I wanna explain that just very briefly. Um, that's a confusing word and I, and I get that. It's, and we talked about maybe not using that word and, and coining something else. The reality is that's the, the, the term that's used in architecture and in pre-design work. Programming basically is understanding what those needs are and pulling all of that information together into a document that starts to define and, and, and then refine what the, the data is telling us in terms of the types of spaces that we need, uh, the activities that go in those spaces, uh, all the supporting things that are needed, all the things that start creating a, a building and a facility and a, and a site that fills that need. So when we say programming, everybody goes to like computer programming. Well, in our, in our world, programming is what I just described. So I just wanted to touch on that really quickly. Uh, but we, to answer your question again, though, we will be coming to that here just uh, in just a little while. And it's an important point. Perfect. I thought that might be the case. I just wanted to. Sure. Confirm. No, thank you. And then Moni, you had a question. Just a comment earlier about, um, to Christina's comment about, we do have a diversity and equity commission. If you would like, um, I'm on it. And so if you would like Russ and we can touch base offline and then see if there's anything we can do, even in terms of, you know, we have 11 folks that are ready to do the equity work and just to kind of see like, what do you think about this? You know, whether it'll go anywhere or not, depending on the timeline and what is it that we're actually looking for, uh, maybe different, but it's worth a try. I would say to at least bring it up. Now, my, if I'm understanding correctly, you're not only on the committee, I believe you're the chair. Is that correct? Yes, I am the chair, so I guess your, your, I can't. Your modesty is showing. Now, that, that's <laughs> such, such important work, and we would love to have a conversation offline with you. And I think Michael might even touch on that a little bit, too, as he's been working on the, the, some of the specific outreach to uh, right. the underrepresented. And that's, it, it's a challenge to find those avenues if there's more avenues and, and we can find even better representation, we're all ears. So absolutely. yes, we will absolutely follow up on that offer. Thank you mm -hmm. very much. All right, we've got a few more minutes on this topic. So if there, anyone else wants to share, now's a great time. All right. Well, before the, the Jeopardy music starts, we'll go ahead and keep moving and Obviously, if you have a question, this is, does not have to be heavily formal, okay? Uh, if you've got a question, we want to hear it and we'll do our best to either answer it or find the answer for you if we don't know. Uh, let's go ahead to item three on our agenda here. Uh, we wanted to touch, just uh, spend about 20 minutes on our public outreach uh, that's been going on. And uh, we're, this, this is really just touching on not, not so much the, the, the findings, but more the process because you asked for this and we, really went back and, and kind of retooled a little bit and really uh, through Michael's work, especially uh, looking at the social media outreach and all the different tools that are out there. Um, and then other things that are on this list are specific to the interviews. And that was uh, very heavily uh, Ken Ballard uh, conducting those interviews. And, and many of you were involved in, in a lot of those. Um, and he just went over the top, honestly, to, uh, to gather as much as we could. And we'll show you that the results of that. In fact, if you look on page, if you look on page 20 uh, of your, uh, you, the, the packet that came out, there's a, there's a, a graph on there. Uh, and it really does show how many touches we actually made. Um, and Drew, I, can you, can you yeah, flip can to that for just a minute? I want to do yeah. that first and then we'll come back and we'll have Michael and, and, uh, and then Ken talk about that, that process as well. But I wanted to show you this because uh, you you guys get to claim this. Uh, when we got started, we were we were having trouble uh, with uh, some of the numbers and really feeling like we were hitting pay dirt in terms of really reaching your community. And even though we did the statistically statistically valid phone survey, uh, you still need to validate that in other ways. And uh, so we really retooled this. And this list, I won't go through all of it, but it does touch on all of the different 
uh, tools that we used and what the results of that were. I do want to explain that some of these numbers that are in red, we still need to fill those in. Those are actually still in process uh, based on uh, the, the project website and some of the work that Matthew uh, and the core planning group have been doing uh, to, your, to your benefit, to the project's benefit. And by the way, <laughs> Matthew is a workhorse and the core planning group have been right beside us this whole time. And and continuing to push and watch and, and make suggestions. And it's been a great uh, experience to uh, pull together what we think is a very defining package here. So those red numbers are going to get filled in uh, over time as that process wraps up, because it's still, uh, we're still gathering. Uh, so with that, um, you can kind of see what some of those numbers are, but it's, it's in the hundreds of people that we've talked to uh, beyond the 200 people in the phone survey. So it's, it's it's an impressive piece of work. And uh, I give so much of that to Ken and to Drew and to Matthew. Thank you, uh, because that's what takes us from a, just a report to a super meaningful one and one that we can defend over time and, and present with confidence. Um, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and kick it to, to Michael Dean. Again, Michael's with uh, DH and has really been uh, running the show on the outreach, the graphics, uh, and uh, he's got a cool video here to show you. So uh, Michael, why don't you go ahead and and show off some of your wares here. Sure. Um, so this, uh, these two things are, are it's, it's a poster and a flyer. It's the same content, but they're they're sized differently. So um, we one of the things that we wanted to do was educate about the overall process that this feasibility study is part of a, a much larger process of. Um, you know, and this is just the start of it. So that's what that bottom graphic is. And then um, also really promoting the uh, virtual public workshop um, on April 20th. So these are flyers that have been passed out to several different groups and uh, posters that have been shared with different organizations in the community. Yeah, I think some of that into that, Michael, is we've found out that word of mouth and physical seems to be a very good way of reaching people. So that was kind of a additional piece here of that puzzle that we've learned in our outreach. Yep, and similar content, uh, Matthew got it into the Covington Spring Guide, but that's just a quick screenshot of, uh, of that in the Recreation Guide. And then there are those graphics. The one on the left is a little more detailed one of showing uh, kind of the public participation period in a more of a flowchart view a little more detail on how um, the whole process works. And I believe the last one on the next for uh, promoting this focus group. So that was uh, around the beginning of the year that that one went out on, on social, um, but the, the groups that were promoted there. So Monty, I see you have a, your, your hand raised. Nope. You I think that's from the previous one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, those are just some of the graphics that that we worked on. Um, the other things I'm going back to your agenda, Drew, but um, I think the last time I, I walked through that telephone survey again, that was interview uh, both landline and cell phones uh, that happened in August and September, uh, and that uh, that data is is we'll visit that again. That goes into the waiting, and it's in uh, the documents that Rustin will walk through later. Um, next on that list is the situational assessment and focus group interviews, which I'll kick it over to Ken to talk about those items because he did the heavy lifting on those. Yeah, and I don't know if we have to get into okay. each one no, of the focus don't want to get into each one. Just okay. Um, the, uh, and then the, kind of the, the other big update since the last time we met was our and Monty, let's definitely talk on that one. Definitely want to leverage, uh, leverage that resource from you. But what the way that we did it were, was, uh, identifying, um, different, uh, different organizations throughout the, the region really and we're basically did some outreach and it was it really looked like hey do you know someone that lives in these regions most of them are seattle seattle wide west side it was a, a lot of pick and shovel work of of connecting with uh more regional starting more regionally and asking hey do you have any contacts in maple valley covington that general area 
And we had some pretty good hits um, through that, through Open Doors and Multicultural Families Organization. Uh, we were able to connect with a, a she's a Tai Chai uh, instructor. Um, and she also coaches the Special Olympics swimming team in Maple Valley. So she was able to share those flyers and the posters throughout her connections. Um, and she also participated in the online survey and, and gave some feedback there. Also reached out to uh, Perilous Ninos, which is a Hispanic. Shared that throughout their group and several other ones as well. Um, the, the Special Olympics one team one I, I felt was uh, a really good uh, contact to make. And then, uh, so right now we are prepping for uh, promotion for the virtual public workshop. Um, what that looks like, um, you know, the, this past year, especially with the pandemic has been difficult. We can't go to soccer games and recruit people or, you know, no, no in-person things. So what we are doing uh, just to bump up a little bit uh, for the virtual public workshop, we are planning um, to run a, a base streaming services uh, in, the, in the areas in Maple Valley and Covington. We have that video that we can show. And then also a direct mailer that will hit the week before. It'll be in mailboxes in uh, the week before the workshop. So um, this last kind of the big push is to just reach as many people as we can uh, for the next virtual public workshop. And those two tactics get pretty good coverage. So that's uh, those are the big the big pieces left in the next couple of weeks. And Drew, do you have the video to to share? I do. There you go. I just open the new share. Um, so hopefully uh, this doesn't bog us down on our bandwidth here. Um, so if it does, I apologize. But um, this is the OTT video that Michael was describing. Um, it's 30 seconds slot that will be begin broadcasting here. So here it goes. Covington and Maple Valley are exploring the feasibility of a new indoor recreation and aquatic center that could replace the existing Covington Aquatic Center. This study is the first step in the multi-year process that will shape the future of recreation in our community. Please join us for a virtual public workshop on Tuesday, April 20th to share your ideas on possible amenities, activities, and locations for a future center. Help us design the future of recreation. Visit recreateandrecreate.com for more information. A little laggy there, but I think you get the, the general sense. <laughs> Sound great on my end, so. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Um, where is it going to show? So that'll be on streaming platforms. Uh, so if you're, you know, watching any on-demand content that still have, that have ads on them, um, it will look like a commercial. And then also uh, pre-roll video. So if you're on YouTube or somewhere, the, the, commercial that shows before the video you want to watch um it'll be in those types of placements yeah. and we did that we did that because um you know if we were to buy cable or something there would be a lot of waste outside of the area so we don't want to reach like downtown seattle or anything so with this with this tactic we were able to um specifically the, the service area all right well michael thank you very much for the the review there and uh, regarding what Ken Ballard has been working on, we're going to be going through that here shortly. Um, but in terms of the outreach, the, the question that we posed for you, uh, what are the outcomes you care most about regarding the public outreach uh, in your community? So it's really focused on those, <coughs> excuse me, on those outcomes. And we just really want to hear from you. Uh, have we missed anything? Is there, is there, are we checking all of those really important boxes here? So we'd love to have any feedback that you can offer on that question. Oh, this is Brock again. Um, so I think I think the uh, the spot will be nice. Uh, it looks like um, all the different techniques that we're using is uh, you know you're we're doing what we can do. Um, somebody had mentioned face-to-face um, um, -face and, um, you know, just word of mouth, I think, is, 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 is always a good one. Um, I think 
I think the more the more things we try, the the more successful it will be. So I, I don't think we ever stop trying. Um, but I, I really like that that little video. I think that's really going to be a good hit. Great, thank you. Uh, and thanks, Brock. We also have. Um, I'll just start some names and then we'll go through them. But Monty, Laura, then Chris, Christina, and Les. I think it's a great video. I do have to say the way we market, I think Christina had hit on it earlier, is how are we marketing? And, and I keep getting back to aquatic versus recreation and does it matter? And maybe it does. To some, it probably does. Um, so just emphasizing, I don't know if there's a way for us to, when we do talk to folks, whether it's via video or flyer, what have you, that it's all inclusive. Because I think there will be a lot of people who may lose interest either way. I, and I don't know if it's too late to market it that way. Um, and then my other outcome would just be, you know, as much as we can do to hit up pretty much everybody, whether it's, you know, language barriers, uh, digital literacy, or what have you, I would just want us to hit up as many people as we can. So we're getting collective voices of, of the two cities and not just some that maybe are digi digitally more literal than others. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. This is Laura Morrissey, and you asked, like, what is the outcome that's most important to you? And the outcome that's most important to me is I want everybody to feel like they've heard about it and that they've had their opportunity to put input into it, but mostly because I want to create buy-in. And I think that's such a big, important part of public outreach is creating buy-in in the community. Um, and so at least if people have kind of heard like, oh yeah, this is happening, even if they didn't go to any of the meetings or the website even, but they've just kind of heard like, oh yeah, this could be a thing. Um, that helps, I think, rather than some people being surprised when all of a sudden like the bond shows up on the ballot for it. Right. And I love the video. That is beyond anything I have seen done in this community. So just major props and kudos to your efforts and for how you are working really hard to reach out to as many people as you can. Great, thank you. And uh, I'm gonna weigh in for just a moment. The, uh, you're exactly right on the buy-in and back to uh, the, the notion of to keep trying and keep pushing on this. Uh, we've spoken about this previously and I'll keep pushing on it, which is we've got to create the buzz. And, and the buzz is everyone on this steering committee talking about this project and, and continually and consciously making connections because you've got connections that we don't. And those are, it's so much more meaningful when information comes from a trusted friend or a colleague or key, you know, co-community leader. So be vocal. We're trying to give you the tools and, and the background. So you've got the confidence that says, man, this, this is right on and, and this can work. And it will work. And this is what's going to take to make that work. Because yeah, if they're just learning about this when the ballot comes out, your chances are not good. <laughs> they're just simply not. And there's a lot that can be done to make sure that does not happen, starting with this process. So uh, thank you for your points. Who's who's next? Uh, Chris is. Thanks. I had uh, two quick things. One's a statement um, actually supporting what Mani uh, brought up, which is um, that sometimes the aquatic part, you know, really overstates everything. Um, I know I personally have been in conversations on the sideline of a soccer game or wherever, and people are like, oh, you're part of that? Well, you know what we really need is indoor turf fields. And they don't realize that it's all the same thing, you know, or, you know, what we really need. And um, I think the more we can get people to understand that this is more of an all-encompassing view, um, I think will be a huge win for the project, to your point, you know, before it hits the bond. Um, so I, I was pretty encouraged as I read through the, the materials and it really you know, went after you know, local ice sheets and it really, it proved the work that we've done looking at everything. And I think it's gonna be really important to figure out ways to get people over that hump that this is just an aquatic center. Um, the second thing I just had, which is a question actually for you guys is, um, you know, I thought the focus groups were gonna be a huge, you know, real win input to this. Um, I'm, my question to you is, did you guys feel those were successful when you look at this and you ran 
14 of them and you had 44 attendees. Is that a win or is that, was that disappointing? And I'm, I'm just kind of curious where you fell on that. And I'm going to actually uh, have uh, asked Ken Ballard to, to weigh in on that one because it's a, that's a, a key question. And uh, there was some frustration on having lots of people uh, sign up or, or lots of people certainly were contacted and then have a, a, a lesser number show up. But Ken, can you touch on that really quick? Uh, yes. Uh, well, I, I think certainly we had every attempt and as Rustin indicated uh, with the number of sessions we had scheduled and uh, the number of people that we had uh, sent invitations to as part of this, I, I think there was a, an attempt to, to get as many people involved as, as we could and we identified. However, the numbers uh, weren't particularly strong and you know that may be somewhat driven by COVID maybe other reasons. Uh, we uh, circled back on a couple of those where we didn't get good turnouts and did them again. Uh, we got uh, a few more people. Um, but I think the information that we received from the people we did talk to was uh, very valuable uh, and pretty consistent in terms of what we heard from all the other sources as well in terms of what they saw as their priorities. However, some of the focus groups had, as their nature is, is very specific uh, interests uh, in different areas. So, you know, certainly the information that we received from some of those groups uh, was, was just different because of their area of interest. But I, yes, would we like to have had more people? Absolutely. But uh, I think we still got valuable information out of that with the people that did attend those sessions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chris. We've got five more minutes for a couple more points. So who's next? Christina. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, a, a couple questions. That video, fantastic. It was truly fantastic. Um, is that something that can get sent to the city so that potentially each of our cities can mark it as well on their Facebook profiles um, and thereby maybe each of us, we all have a different target of, um, of people we know. Um, and if we're all sharing it, obviously we're going to create a bigger buzz. Um, there, there's one thing I have a question about. There's an icon that came on it, uh, towards the end. It had, it was, it was a round icon. Um, and it had a swimming, a person swimming. And I was just waiting for an, another icon to come on, you know, to, to show that there's more than just swimming going on here. Um, and it didn't, <laughs> uh, not not to pressure our media or our marketing strategists, but if there was just something else to say that this is more, this is more than just swimming. And I love our aquatic center. I really do. I think it's something that's been an answer to so many families, even, and especially during COVID when it was, be, when it was able to be open. Um, but, you know, if we can get the buzz out, buzz creates ownership. The more I, if I hear Covington or Maple Valley or Black Diamond um, anywhere, and if I'm in a different city, my, my ears perk up because that's mine. That's mine. And I, I, I have a, a, you know, a, a big chunk of ownership where we live and they're not giant cities by any means in which maybe why the ownership is so much more um, sincere. It's more intimate. Um, so if we can get a buzz out there that creates the ownership and then like, uh, I'm so sorry. I, I forgot who said it, but we, you know, we don't want surprises on our ballots. I don't like them. I don't think anybody does. That's impersonal. That's not, um, that's just not personal. Uh, so if we can get, you know, a buzz by creating more social media presence, I would be all in on that. I would love to share the video if that's something we can do. Yeah. Michael, can you speak to that really quick on how that could be shared? Yeah, we can absolutely share that out. Um, with, with everyone, we, it just got finished with production, but I would assume in the next week or so, we can get that out to the group or probably in the next couple of days to, to share out. There's also, so that version is in, um, I didn't mention this, but that version is obviously um, we'll use to promote the uh, workshop, but we are planning to um, create an, a more evergreen version that can be used after the workshop as well. So um, it would just kind of expand that middle section, probably wouldn't broadcast it, but just to have on hand to educate and kind of continue that, uh, that buzz, as, as you say, um, ap even after the workshop, so. Wonderful, thank you so much. 
Great, thank you. I think we've got time for uh, one more. Is there another one out there, Drew? Les is out there. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, so two things, uh, one, love the video and, and the professional nature and the, the production quality, I think reflects well on the project as a whole. Um, and that will be key, I think, even in the bond in a bond effort to show that things are being done right and done well. And so uh, I, I think that that's, that's awesome. I was curious, are there any projected or estimated number of hits that would occur or is there a, a, a is this done as a buy for a certain number of, of hits uh, when we distribute this, um, you know, um, so is, how, how is that set up? Yeah, I have that not quite at my fingertips, um, but we have estimated number of impressions for sure. And I can pull that. It'll just take me a few minutes to, to track that down. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, any others, Drew? Uh, nope, okay. not currently, unless someone else wants to chime in real quick. I have something real quick. This is Brock. Yes. There is a group um, in Black Diamond they're called the Blue Line Consulting Group, and they're working on the Black Diamond Recreation Plan. And they had uh, invited me to come to one of their meetings with the uh, City Council and the Planning Commission to um, talk about the planning, the, uh, the, the effort to create a rec recreation plan in Black Diamond. And I spoke to them and I told them about, you know, the gym and how much we appreciate all the people from around the area is coming to the gym, but also emphasize that they might be able to get a hold of you guys because they're looking at ways to get information, get out to the people, get input from, from the, from the communities. And I said, you know, we got a group right here in, in Maple Valley Covington that's doing the same thing. So I don't know if they ever got a hold of you, but their name was a uh, blue line consulting group. And basically kind of doing the same thing that you guys are doing for Maple Valley Covington. They're putting together a plan for the recreation in Black Diamond. So if they didn't get a hold of you, okay. I will, I'll touch base with them again and, and bring them your way again. So yeah, please do. We're, we're looking for every opportunity for synergy. And right, and exactly. That's what I was thinking right along those lines. Absolutely. Why, why do something totally opposite here that isn't you know, isn't going to attract people from Maple Valley and Covington, same thing. So anyway. absolutely. Well, excellent. Well, I looking at our timing here um, on our agenda, this is our point in time where we're going to take a five minute break. Um, and so we'll do that. What I'd like to do is uh, once we reconvene, we're going to spend uh, probably 45 minutes or so talking specifically about program. We'll answer some of those uh, earlier questions that were asked. Um, and then we'll talk about funding and then that's some site evaluation to wrap the, the meeting up. But uh, I would already like to say this has been a very uh, meaningful meeting already. Uh, just the notion of uh, the impression of uh, the aquatics being very heavy is very interesting. And as unintentional as that has been, uh, the, you know, your perception is the reality and that's uh, what we're here to learn. So uh, appreciate all the great feedback so far uh, so let's take uh, take five minutes, and Matthew, I'm going to suggest that we reconvene at just a couple minutes before seven. I think we are good for intermission. All right. Got music, Drew? I don't have music. Play the video I again. Could, I could open the door so you could hear my kids running around. <laughs> Entertaining. <laughs> now, Drew, play the, play the video again. I want to, I want to, the, the comment on the next icon that we might add in there was interesting. I'd really like to watch it again. 
The cities of Covington and Maple Valley are exploring the feasibility of a new recreation and aquatic center that could replace the existing Covington Aquatic Center. This study is the first step in a multi-year process that will shape the future of recreation in our community. Please join us for a virtual public workshop on Tuesday, April 20th to share your ideas on possible amenities, activities, and locations for a future center. Help us design the future of recreation. Visit recreateandrecreate.com for more information. Drew, you didn't share the screen, so we just heard oh. it. <laughs> but the killer track. <laughs> uh, technology. Here, there try we it go. again. Um, for more information. Oh, I had rewind. The cities of Covington and Maple Valley are exploring the feasibility of a new indoor recreation and aquatic center that could replace the existing Covington Aquatic Center. This study is the first step in a multi-year process that will shape the future of recreation. Please join us for a virtual public workshop on Tuesday, April 20th to share your ideas, amenities, activities, and locations for a future center. Help us design the future of recreation. Visit recreateandrecreate.com for more information. And location. I think that was the slide that was in question. Right. And that's what Christina was saying that she was waiting for that next icon to show up and it didn't. Uh, and that's a great observation. I, I, and again, I just one more sort of point on it. We're, we're aquatic heavy. So uh, I don't, Matthew, any, I know we're on a break, but any, any thoughts on that idea? Um, well, I'm just really pleased that they brought up that point about the aquatic focus. I, I don't want us to lose track of the fact that some of the steering committee members asked if we could promote this as a community center. Um, and I don't think we made a mistake, but that is an important comment to some of them to be that broad and to not lose any audience members. Mm -hmm. So um, point well taken, I think. Yeah, yeah, I, I know agree. that you've already revised this video. It's probably done with production, but it's a good point that it would there is room for another icon there. Well, it also helps inform the, the virtual public workshop that we can do a lot in that presentation to make sure that, that any perception of it being aquatic heavy, we can, we can dispel that by uh, just by design of how that presentation comes together. So uh, it's a great point. Rest in the point though that it is aquatic heavy is intentional. And I think we can be upfront about that. And we have been. Right. Uh, and the materials right. have always referenced that we need to take into account the replacement of the aquatic center. Not that that's feasible, but we're studying if it's feasible to replace the aquatic center. So right. yeah, I, I think that the messaging is important, but it includes being candid that we've got aquatics to replace. Like Laura made the comment. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. All right, we'll just wait a couple more minutes and we'll get started again. I'm gonna go get some popcorn. <laughs> And Russ, and part of why I'm not doing the full screen is it formats it so that it captures it the entire picture. So I can't zoom in. So okay, yeah, it's it, that's great. You know, that is one of the 
one of the advantages that that COVID, COVID has brought us is uh, everyone really ramping it up for the most part in terms of the technology to be able to gather virtually. And uh, I'm looking at uh, Christina on the East Coast. Um, I'm actually broadcasting from the historic Columbia Gorge Hotel down in Hood River, Oregon. <laughs> uh, I don't have this, this this elegant office. This is actually a hotel room um, I'm down here for some family business. But isn't it wonderful that we can still all participate uh, regardless of where we are? It's uh, just a, a marvelous step forward for everybody. And here um, I thought you were into paint, paintings. <laughs> my, yeah, my room is pink, and it's like no, no. okay. Uh, and then, the, but it's a beautiful painting behind me, so it's. Yeah. If you haven't been here before, it's uh, it's it's worth a, a stay. Uh, a lot of fun, great service, great restaurant, and just a gorgeous setting down here. So, well, with that, we're at almost seven o'clock. So let's go ahead and and reconvene. Uh, thanks again for for joining in tonight. Uh, this next piece is really a, a a big chunk of this entire study, and uh, it really is a culmination of months of work. And I'm going to start with the question, not that I'm going to. Uh, have you comment quite yet, but I want you to have that at front of mind as we're going through. Uh, the, it, we'll keep this presentation as brief as we can, but we've got to hit some real key salient points here uh, to stimulate that conversation. And the culmination of this conversation is to actually take a vote to uh, make sure, yes, we have the right package that we're going to move forward with, or here's the package with modifications, really getting all of you talking amongst yourselves uh, about this. And again, we mentioned values at the very beginning of this conversation. Uh, we want to make sure we understand what you truly do value in a recreation center like this. We have a lot of information from the public. What we want to make sure is that you have seen and heard all of that, that this is reflective of that and of your values. And it's your opportunity to, to literally steer a bit. And so uh, that, that question uh, really comes down to, do the current program document findings represent what a, an indoor aquatic and recreation center should include here? Uh, that's a, just a fundamental question. What changes would you like to discuss? So that's what we're gonna get to here in 20 minutes or so. Um, and again, we'll, we'll try to get through this quickly, but there's a lot to, to talk about. And uh, Ken uh, Ballard uh, has been uh, doing the lion's share of the work on this. Um, in terms of the market analysis work, uh, someone had already mentioned the, the, the you know, local, regional, national statistics, those are really important for context so that you understand the context in which the decisions that you're making and approving here fit within and to make sure that you've got a good understanding of all that. It doesn't mean Covington, Maple Valley, this, this region has to follow a national model, but it is important that you understand what that national model is starting to look like so that you know how you fit into that. So we're going to have Ken talk about his findings on the market analysis side, demographics. That's all informative to where this program document came from. And then we're going to kick into the, the, the findings that we've come up with, the list of, of uh, items there, the different uh, scopes of, of the project, and then ultimately have those questions and take that vote. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Ken. Good evening. Um, well, let me just briefly kind of go through the demographic summary on this. Uh, you may remember back uh, when we first started talking about this, we were uh, looking at a possible different uh, market areas that could be identified. We finally, uh, as we got further along with the study, uh, determined that our primary market, and rightfully so, is really the two communities. Um, and that's, that's who uh, the project would first and foremost serve. But we certainly realized that depending upon the elements that we'd have in the facility, uh, that we have the ability to draw folks from outside of just what we call that primary market being the immediate two cities boundaries. And that's where we've identified this kind of circle in there. And we've adjusted that over time uh, to reflect uh, where we think you, we can pull from for uh, the facility that you'll see described here. And uh, it certainly won't as we get further to the outskirts of this secondary market area, our market penetration rate drops. Uh, but it, it's a large area. And to be honest with you, if you look at some of the demographic uh, statistics and just the number of people in that market area, we probably couldn't build a facility large enough to service all of those folks anyway. But 
We also recognize that there's, a, especially when you get to the secondary market, there's a lot more providers out there that are currently in the marketplace, whether they're public facilities, uh, nonprofits, um, i.e. YMCAs, or even the for-profit sector. So that boundary there basically represents our secondary service area. And once we identified these two service areas, then we started looking at the demographic characteristics. So we'll kind of page down a little bit. And this is kind of a summary of a lot of different detail in there. It looks at the population in the primary market uh, based on uh, 2020 projections and projecting out to 2025. Um, I, I have to say that as we get into the point where now we're uh, 11 years past the last census, and it'll probably be a, a while before we get uh, this census numbers, it, the modeling, regardless of whether it's coming from the Census Bureau or others, is a little tougher. We just have uh, you know, a lot of time that's transpired since the, the, um, the last census was um, in place. So uh, we also have projections out there for uh, what the population will be in that primary and secondary service area. Now, the secondary service area is inclusive of the primary. So the secondary market includes the primary plus the secondary, but it's still, you can see it had basically another 100,000 people in that secondary market. It's large. And we still have over 50,000 or projections to be around uh, over 50,000 by 2025. So we have a significant market uh, just for a facility if it just served that existing uh, two communities. And we know it'll, it'll draw people from beyond that. Some of the other key things that we came up with in terms of that are real important is we looked at things like average household size that tells us the presence of children we have very high household sizes, so it tells us there's a lot of children in the marketplace. Uh, we looked at ethnicity and uh, on that, and uh, you know, there's a, a significant, uh, you know, not large, but significant enough uh, Hispanic and Asian population in the marketplace. Um, we looked at age uh, range, you have a much younger population, and we have the comparisons with uh, not only the state of Washington, but the national numbers as well on all of these as kind of benchmarks. So you're a younger population, more children. And then we also looked at the median household income and high levels of income. Uh, we also looked at kind of the stratification of the income uh, across different uh, markers. And that also showed higher numbers as well. So, you know, that's all kind of summarized in this next section there. And it basically tells us that we have a strong market uh, for a facility uh, to service not only the primary market area, but if we draw some from the secondary. And we did keep in mind, and even in setting the boundaries of the secondary service area, kind of where the Covington Aquatic Center draws some of its users from now as well. So it was based somewhat on that, although not entirely. So that's kind of a real quick uh, 30,000 foot uh, assessment of the demographics. Um, as Rustin indicated, we also look at um, some participation statistics that are put together every year by the National Sporting Goods Association. And they survey people nationally in terms of what they participate in. And we're able to utilize that information, apply it to uh, the market area because they break um, participation rates in a lot of different sports activities down by um, not only area of the country, i.e. the Pacific Northwest, but also by income levels, age distribution, and other factors. So we take that, we average that all out, and this kind of shows you in the first column, the percentage of the population over six years old that participates in these different activities, as well as we can project for the market area, and in this case, we're looking at the primary market, how that translates into numbers of people and the growth or decline over, over time. The key thing in here is we've got a lot of different um, growth in every single category when we look at from 2010 to 2025. And that's basically because of increases in the population base. But um, it does show then again, uh, opportunities that will continue to grow in terms of drawing people to a facility. It shows you kind of relatively some of the strengths of participation in different activities. The key takeaway out of this is that uh, most of the activities that with the highest levels of participation tend to be more um, fitness related. Actually, over time, some of the uh, more traditional uh, team sports have actually shown a, a, a either a stabilization or a decline in participation over time. So again, that kind of helps us a little bit. And this is one of the graphics we use. And now these are national numbers, but it shows you um, 
uh, changes in the rate of participation from 2010 through 2019. And the green on the, uh, in, the in the far column is uh, those activities that are increasing in, in uh, participation. And obviously a lot of the things that are on there like kayaking aren't necessarily something we would see indoors at a facility, but it gives you a sense of that's the number one uh, growth activity right now nationally. So it, we use them more just as a benchmarking. But again, you see a lot of that being more fitness related activities, some uh, uh, new more emerging sports that are in there as well. And then then the kind of more, it's supposed to be reddish, but it kind of is, a, is more of a purple color are those activities that are declining in participation over time or have for the last 10 years. But we have to be a little careful with this. So even some of the percentages, the rate and the number of people that are participating is still very high. As an example, swimming has decreased 7.4%, but it's still 51 million uh, people originally now 48 million. And even though we've seen that decline, it's still the third most popular participatory sport in the United States. So while it's important, we don't wanna base everything on the trends, but it does help us understand where things are, are going in terms of popularity. And we have over the last 10 years, certainly seen this for the most part in most facilities in terms of where the demand has fallen for different activities. So we found it to be somewhat uh, true to form. Not to just focus solely on the, um, on the sports aspects of this, we also then look at information that's put together by the National Endowment for the Arts, and they do a periodic, periodic survey of Americans on a national basis only, and their rates of participation in different cultural arts activities, and that's only done for adults, unfortunately. Uh, the information that's available for cultural arts is not nearly as robust as it is for um, uh, sports and uh, fitness activities. But we did look at that. Uh, we've been able to track that through their 2002 uh, study through eight and 12 and 17 and looking at the percentages. Um, some activities have seen slight increases, especially over the last five years, but generally a lot of the cultural arts rates of participate, participation have remained relatively consistent especially over the last say 10 years from 2008 on. So not a lot of growth in a lot of those uh, different activity levels and it breaks it down into a lot of different areas from performing arts to visual arts uh, to actual uh, participating in those activities to going to view um, uh, again, events that are put on by others. So there's a lot of different categories that will go into this as well. So that kind of provides us a little bit of a backdrop that we can kind of marry up with the demographic trends. And that kind of helps us understand um, kind of the market, if you will, both locally as well as nationally. And that's just one of the, uh, again, uh, tools that we use in this process. Certainly, I think we value, and, and you'll see this when we start talking about the program, we value the input that we receive from the local community more so than we do these statistics, but they are still valuable ones to uh, have through this process. Great, thank you, Ken. So th there's, uh, this 18 pages is, a, is actually a summary of uh, about 60 pages uh, that'll be in the final report as an appendix, but a lot of good background information that, again, just more tools to help us uh, inform what that final program document starts to look like. So Drew, if you can go ahead and skip down to, um, let's go ahead and move to our matrix um, a little bit more. Um, oh, I think this actually is- Okay, go ahead and start there, sure. Part of this. so. Um, as you all have probably seen in this document, we've identified and kind of created a matrix to kind of show the main areas that people were indicating. And we had to come up with some way of, um, I guess, ranking them is one way of saying it so that we're not just saying every space that was mentioned one time in a meeting um, or a group. So, we looked at the phone survey, which is the statistically accurate, the situational assessments, um, focus groups, public workshops, um, and then began to kind of put marks on those as to which amenities were talked about and had um, numerous kind of hits on that item. And the phone survey being the statistically accurate one was where we started, and it's probably the most important one. Um, 
interesting that most of the spaces that are indicated in that phone survey also um, were pretty popular throughout as the main items that have the higher scoring. Um, the big part of this is we base this on all of the community input. And as Ken can attest to, um, surprisingly um, consistent was the read yeah. that we were getting as far as amenities that were desired, whether that was a rec pool, a competition pool, or teen or senior spaces, they were all pretty um, consistent. Um, one area that was a hot button item um, is the weights and cardio space that we can get into a little bit more here in a little bit. Um, but I wanted to point out that potential partners or stakeholders here, we have a bunch of TBDs in there because we were still finalizing those interviews as we were putting this together. Um, the therapy pool we feel is one that might have a draw to it. And also based on that last um, meeting that happened, the weights and cardio might be another one to get an asterisk in here. So that would move both of those up into a five ranking. Um, so um, in the spirit of trying to go through this, it'd be great to incorporate everything that everyone wants, but um, you get to a point where you can't afford everything. So looking at how we can um, start to identify those, we took the ones that were listed as fives and incorporated them into the program that we have included and sent you guys in this packet. A um, couple of things to point out, child watch and party rooms, even though they rank low, they are basically spaces that are fairly small and don't cost a lot that are complementary uses. Um, so if you have a rec pool, you're gonna wanna have a party room. If you're gonna have fitness space, you're gonna need child watch for people to drop their kids off and watch them for 20 minutes to an hour while they're working out. So those are also included in this space. And this doesn't include any of the kind of ancillary spaces, whether that's a office space, storage, um, we're looking at big major amenity spaces. Um, so this was just our first take at it. And the ultimate goal here is to determine whether or not the spaces that we've identified in the program are the correct ones and whether or not um, we need to revisit those and which additional couple of these we should be adding to that program for consideration. So um, on that, Rustin, I don't know if you want to go into kind of a values discussion first before we start talking a little bit more about these um, as to what the steering committee members might want to consider um, in their thought of this. Well, sure. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on this because this is really a, a huge focus for tonight. Um, We'll touch on it and then we're going to come back and revisit it uh, with your your input and your comments there but we did uh, put a, a section in here on how did we arrive at the program we're going to be talking about here it's really those it's pretty basic fundamental stuff that we're testing tonight and we are wanting to make sure based on everything that we have collected uh, these are our impressions uh, our findings and ultimately our recommendations for your consideration and for uh, additional comment and, and input here but the basic needs, uh, the community and, and their expectations, that's uh, what all of the, the outreach has been all about, us learning about you and, and what your community really truly wants and needs there. Uh, supporting that diversity, the equity and the inclusion, uh, all ages and abilities, that's the beauty of, and the wonder of a facility like this. It's amazing uh, the, the, everything that it, they bring together. Uh, wide range of recreational needs, uh, aquatic sports, arts, um, needs of replacing uh, the uh, Covington Aquatic Center, obviously we talked about previously. Um, necessary amenities for the greater public uh, and their entryway into more specialized needs. It's a, it's a, that's why we call it uh, recreate and recreate. That, that's what these facilities are about is people coming in and really understanding themselves uh, in, a, in the true sense of wholeness and, and wellness and, and understanding what their needs are, what they like, what they don't like, what they uh, want to pursue for, for new uh, opportunities. 
So it's a it's just a wonderful opportunity for people, uh, providing program space for organizations to collaborate in community health and well-being as well at a community level, and prioritizing amenities to align with the, the funding sources that are available. So those are the real fundamentals and the boxes that we need to check as we're collecting all this data and putting it together as a program. Uh, and in the secondary amenities, uh, the physical, the mental, the emotional, uh, at the end of the day, we need to check those boxes as well. There's different ways of doing that, but uh, in the grand scheme of things, the collection of all this needs to fundamentally check those boxes as well. Uh, we talked about the market assessment uh, and the evaluation of the secondary markets and things. So uh, we do, and Drew touched, touched on the child watch and, and that there, we're bringing also to this conversation the expertise that, that our uh, collective companies on the design and, and feasibility team uh, possess. Uh, we've done many, many of these, and there's lessons learned that we brought to this, uh, this matrix and, and what our recommendations are. So let's go ahead and kick to that. We're going to spend just a couple more minutes, and then we're going to get the conversation started. Yep. Uh, Drew, let's go ahead and go down to yep. the uh, summary of spaces. Yep. So we'll come back up to this when we do this yeah. final discussion, but um, yeah. so, so then, everyone's go ahead. Oh yeah. So um, obviously things that are included above is the lobby and entry. So all your vestibule, uh, public entryways, public toilets, um, those items. So these are kind of first um, blushes at these. We'll be going through these size pieces as part of the feasibility study with Ken, but um, between us and his expertise, we've kind of derived certain total square footages for these spaces. Um, another item above that's not up there is center administration. So this is basically all, all of the admin areas that are associated with this facility. Um, then we get into youth and community spaces. Um, so running through the party room, child watch, youth teen space, community room. Um, so we've included a lot of that. We even have kind of a catering and teaching component in this. It's not um, ranked high above. Um, we're showing that as potential in here. Um, that's something that we could either keep or take out. Um, wellness venues, gymnasium, indoor track. Um, and that could be as simple as just the walking area around kind of your floor area. Um, exercise studios. So future gymnasium. Currently, I think we're caring for two gymnasiums with this, and then this would be adding a third one into there. Um, potentially a climbing and bouldering wall. So those are items that could be added into this. Um, and then as we go down the aquatic center and into a rec or family recreation component, and then the competitive eight lane pool. Um, also including spectator seating for 300 people. And then obviously some of the ancillary spaces that go along with that. Um, getting into locker rooms, it's not mentioned in the amenities, but you obviously need locker rooms to go with uh, your pool deck and your pools and your gyms and all those spaces. So having those added in. Um, one of the unique things that we started to look at in this is the site development and potential pad sites. Um, basically, what we are hearing is that there is a need for some large um, turf areas or potential um, uses that maybe are more geared towards having a potential partner um, develop those. So at a minimal cost, having the city develop the site so that it could accommodate and basically set it out for RFQ amongst different providers to have them compete over who would build that pad site. So that's also something that we've thrown in here as a potential development item. Um, and then some additional um, amenity spaces that could be added. And this is where we have to start kind of picking and choosing because um, as we start to add these, it starts to impact the total cost and feasibility of the project, so. All right, so and the, go ahead and, uh, and, and slide back up for a minute. That as Drew, Drew was describing this, again, this is our, these are our 
basically well-informed placeholders uh, based on the information that we've collected. Uh, what we do with this information from here before we kick it into your comments and questions, um, what we do from this point is uh, continue to study this. Ken Ballard is gonna take this information and start running some, um, some business uh, type of models uh, to understand what the uh, operations costs would be, what the revenue potential is based on these types of spaces. Uh, the architects on the team take a look at what the construction costs uh, are likely to be uh, based on a, uh, assumptions on a time frame, and really try to complete the whole picture because we're still trying to test if it's feasible or not. And when we come in and, and if that funding stack that Kate's gonna be speaking to here shortly, um, if that indicates that there's more money than what we have identified, wow, it's really easy to add more uh, of the next prioritized spaces into the mix. Um, Counter to that, if it, we find that, you know, it's not likely we're gonna be able to fund all of this, we then take the, the lowest priority things that are in that list and start removing them and consider that future addition, you know, future opportunity and truly dial in on what we can uh, call feasible and, and affordable. So um, so with that all, all that in mind, uh, now's the time that uh, we're gonna kick it back to you and I'll re-ask you the question from your perspective, do the current program document findings represent what an indoor aquatic recreation center should include here? Here meaning in your city. Uh, and what changes would you like to discuss? And what we'd like to do um, is have, take that input, take that conversation, and then ultimately have someone make a motion to either uh, uh, accept and approve uh, what we have found here or to do the same with an amended uh, list of, of program spaces. So with that, who's got the who's got the first comment or question? So we have Les up on here and I don't know if he ever uh, lowered his hand, but Les, then Laura, Chris, and Monty will start there. Thank you. Yeah, this is Les Burberry. And the first question or the first comment I had was um, in the two items that are ranked equally in fitness with fours, an indoor track in weights or cardi and cardio. Um, and I, I understand that those are not included at the present time, but that would be the next up were we to add something. I just wanted to, to note that, that we do have in both communities, large numbers of opportunities um, with fitness clubs, weights and cardio. What we don't have uh, are indoor track opportunities um, for the many people that you know do walk and in inclement weather would uh, would really take that that opportunity. So I, I, um, I, I would just say in in a tie in those area those two, I would I would certainly favor indoor track, uh, especially if it could be, uh, incorporated at a minimal cost at, you know, surrounding gymnasium or as a second tier above the gymnasium. Um, the second uh, thing I, I wanted to just ask about was I saw a very large differential uh, between the number of parking spaces noted for Maple Valley and Covington. And I'm assuming that that's based on current code that you were pulling out of, of uh, um, you know, uh, code date, uh, uh, code information. Um, and that's, that would certainly, I think, be something that we are looking at in Maple Valley in that we do not like and we do not want huge tracts of, of um, you know, parking spaces. And so the large, you know, disparity there, um, I, I think is something that we would not desire in the city of Maple Valley. Um, and we, and so if there were a site that were workable uh, there, um, I, I'm, I'm just not sure that it, that would be a necessary complication, that there would be more um, this huge number of uh, parking spaces required uh, in that instance. Sure. Well, Les, I want to thank you. You raised two really critically important points here. Um, 
I'll start with the latter one first. We're, we're still uh, looking actively at the sites. And even though there is, a, 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 as you said, for current code, a, a bit of a disparity there, we do think there's conversation that's going to happen that is very likely to, to make that uh, uh, a lot more suitable for a project like this. Um, and that's going to be a kind of an ongoing conversation, um, certainly with the uh, uh, planning, planning department there. Um, so you're right. And that's not scaring us off at all on this. It's just a, a point in the process here. And we're going to continue to have more and more conversations. And we'll talk about that in site development here in, in a moment as well. Uh, and then your other point, uh, I want to really emphasize again, and maybe even have Ken just very quickly weigh in on this too. Uh, the, the, the fitness center, uh, cardio weights, um, it has been an interesting dialogue because you're right, there's a lot of providers there. And we had a few comments uh, from some, some key stakeholders that are uh, school districts, especially, I believe, that were saying uh, weights are still in, in fitness equipment, cardio, that kind of thing is still important in a center like this. And it doesn't really compete with a private club, it's a different clientele. But Ken, can you touch on that real quick? Yeah, and just reinforce that exactly what we've heard is um, some reluctance due to the fact that there's a number of other providers in the marketplace with that. But as Russ indicated, generally, this is an entry level uh, into kind of the whole fitness uh, segment of that. Um, so it, it's oftentimes a building market for um uh, for the private sector. And in fact, we've done a lot of facilities around the country where we've built significant uh, indoor uh, centers that have a pretty good sized uh, uh, weight cardio and fitness area. And then the private sector has come in after that facility has been built and open and built their facilities. So um, they're, they're understanding that that has the opportunity to build market for them. So, but it is, it is, is and it's been stated, is one of the things where we had kind of a mixed reaction from people. We had some people that were saying, yes, we, we need that. Um, uh, the other ones are membership based, have sometimes high price points. So it was needed. Others saying, look, they're here. Uh, they're providing that already. Uh, much like was said, hey, we have other higher demands that uh, we don't have in the marketplace. So it was really kind of a mixed reaction, especially when we got to our stakeholder uh, meetings and focus groups. However, when we started talking to some of the potential partners out of this and really more on the medical side of things, there was a more of an interest from them in the fitness amenities as being important to uh, potentially them being partners in the facility. And so that that may be one of the issues that, that comes into play if, if we're able to potentially attract a, a medical partner where that may be a, a more of an essential element uh, from their standpoint. All right, thanks, Ken. So we're hoping that's a, a discussion point tonight as we keep going on this conversation, but let's go ahead and go. Uh, who's next? Laura. This is Laura Morrissey. Um, interestingly, I kind of wanted to echo what Les said. It was already in my mind, but um, just to voice my support for the idea of an indoor track. Um, I'm, my life, I'm actually a product of indoor tracks. I started running on an indoor track at a YMCA when I was 10, and I'm now an ultra runner and a marathoner, and it all traces back to that time. But up here, um, when the weather is not necessarily great for nine to 10 months out of the year, that is one thing that I do hear people complaining about uh, or mentioning or asking um, because they don't have a good place to just move their bodies without getting rained on, dumped on, snowed on, or, or something like that. So also when I look at like the, the weights, the cardio, the group studio, the dance studio, all of these fours, my natural tendency is when I'm limited um, in resources, what can I do that will get me the most flexibility that will get that will be flexible enough to get me everything that I want and so I think I tend to be drawn towards the group studio dance studio just because more there's more flexibility with a room like that and it seems like it would service more people but I find the whole conversation with weights and cardio kind of fascinating and I wonder if there might be a if we have to a possible compromise to where we could do use like dumbbell carts or simpler weights and somehow incorporate all of that into one room. All right, excellent, thank you. Great, great thoughts. Other, other comments? Yeah, we have Chris next. Yeah, I had uh, 
two questions that I just wanted to uh, follow up on. First, I was hoping you guys could define for us better um, the word you used on here is the indoor family recreation pool. Um, we've talked a lot about how those facilities have evolved over time with splash pads, water slides. Um, I'm assuming this is a smaller version of this, possibly without those things. But if you could just define what you're assuming here and what's included for the family pool, that would be helpful, especially as a parent who's had to drive his kids to Federal Way for birthday parties. It would be really nice to know. Um, and then my second question was, I think one of the things we all identified early on in this process was the surprising number of times the rock wall came up in our community feedback. And it's listed on our kind of our secondary list here, we could add later. Um, and I'm just curious the, the methodology or the thoughts behind why that would be secondary after we saw it come up over and over from the community. Yeah, Ken, do you wanna to speak to the rec pool? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, we've identified a, a, a space for that in terms of what would actually be in that rec pool. Uh, remains to be seen. But I would say this, probably for just a benchmark of what we may be talking about, it would be the Federal Way Community Center pool. Um, but that's, you know, you don't have to have all those things that are there. But generally, you know, it's some shallower water, it's moving water, um, have some interactive features, may have slides, most facilities do. Uh, but the magnitude of that just depends. Um, that would be a whole exercise once we, uh, uh, the project would move forward to design to really determine what, what that would be. Um, but it would be, and I think one of the other key things on it is it's, while we call it a recreational pool, the other probably word that would go with that would be a program pool because um, it can be utilized heavily for um, aqua exercise classes, it can be utilized also for learn to swim programs. It's the warmer water, so it's more conducive to both of those things. It's also typically shallower water than what you'd see in the competitive pool. So it's not just a, while a fun aspect of it is certainly there, uh, it's, it also serves a very important need uh, for providing opportunities for uh, uh, conventional recreation lessons and water exercise classes and those types of things as well. And then uh, either between Ken and Drew, uh, can you uh, uh, specifically talking about the rock wall, uh, the, yep. the process that we used on that and keep in mind too that rock walls can actually be installed inside of gymnasium spaces as well. We, we uh, have seen that many, many times. Uh, and any number of these spaces are very intentionally going to be uh, uh, very, very flexible in, in their use so that it's not overly designed or dedicated to a handful of, of activities. It's, it's as plain vanilla as we can make it in terms of programmability and flexibility. But uh, Ken and, and uh, Drew, can you touch on yeah. the rock wall? Well, the rock walls, are, it, depending upon the magnitude that you want to go, aren't, uh, aren't huge uh, allocations of space or even budget. So uh, oftentimes those are carried as an option through this. And to be honest with you, uh, if that's something that people want to do, it, that's not a deal breaker any way you look at it. Historically on climbing walls, they've been either boom or bust. Um, and so they've been either dramatically successful or not successful at all. There's not too much in the middle. Um, it has to do with where they are. It has to do with uh, who basically is in charge of that wall and sets the routes and who basically takes charge of that. And uh, the ones that are more successful have people that are really dedicated to making sure the wall works. Um, quite honestly, it's, it's who you have that's with it. But I mean, the grand scheme of things that we're talking about, um, a rock wall would be easy to include in this facility if it's something that people wanna, wanna see in there. And then it's a question of magnitude and whether you wanna go for height in terms of uh, rope climbing or you wanna go bouldering, which is more of a lateral movement. Thank you. Great, Chris, thank you. Uh, Drew, who we got next? So we got Mani, Marita, Brock. Okay. All right, so I just wanted to um, make a comment about the indoor track, reiterating what I think um, 
Laura was saying, but safety comes to my mind and it's not just with the indoor track, but in general, having like an all inclusive rec center, uh, one with the, you know, to me, it's a one stop shop. And to me, you mentioned the word value, what that means to me. Value to me is spending time with my little kids or my family or what have you. I'm a full-time working mom. I commute. By the time I get home, they're outside waiting for me to get done because they haven't seen mom all day. So it matters to me that I'm with them. And if I can be in a one-stop shop where I could do my weights or I could run or whatever my kids are doing something and my husband's doing something, that matters to me. And I think that speaks to community. I'm not going to talk about everybody in the community, but even in the diverse um, you know, populations, we do have to look at marginalized groups or groups that may not feel safe running in Covington or Maple Valley or whatever. And I'm not going to get into what has happened in this country, but you know what, for me, a person of color, I am not running at night. So like having something where I could feel safe um, matters to me. So I just wanted to speak to that values and, and safety part. Excellent. That, that's right on point. Thank you so much for that. Um, all great points. All right, Drew, uh, who is next? Marita. Okay, um, I just have a couple of questions as well. Um, when I saw gymnasium, I immediately thought that that included weights and cardio, but I'm assuming it doesn't um, since that's on the addition list. So is the gymnasium like a, a basketball court with bleachers type of situation? Is that what we're looking at for the gymnasium? Correct, it'd be court sports. Okay. Okay. Um, so I have been been a member of a gym where I did a boot camp in early in the morning in the gymnasium part of the gym. I mean, they had the regular weights and cardio and all that too, but the boot camp was held on those courts and they just brought in the equipment and it was before basketball started. I think that class was really early, like 530 in the morning, but as an interim step, we could do that. And I think it was Laura earlier that said, you know, maybe you put weights on carts or something like that, or um, I'm not sure if that was, you were the right person, Laura, sorry. Um, but that is definitely a possibility as, a, as an interim um, step to address that before you can have a separate space for weights and cardio. Um, and then I had a question on the community room. Um, so 3,000 square feet, that would, I'm looking over at my other screen here where I have it bigger. Um, so 3,000 square feet was a little bit bigger than I was thinking when I originally looked at the plan. So that was good at first, you know, when I first saw the square footage, but um, is it, will it include dividers? Um, so that if somebody, if we want, if three groups want to have activities at the same time, we can pull those walls out. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the most common approach that we take to community spaces okay. like that. Again, it just increases the flexibility of the space. Yeah. Okay, great. Those are my questions. Perfect, so thank you. Really you. Get, you really get three rooms out of that potentially, right. or one very yeah. large room, or one small, and two two that are, are one other space that's larger. So it provides a great deal of flexibility in terms of how it's utilized. Awesome. Yeah. All right, let's move on to Brock and then Rosie. Okay, um, I think that the overall look at this, the, all the fives on there are really good. I, when I first uh, took a look at it, I thought weights and cardio and indoor track would both be um, good additions. And the, the, the input that Marita had about utilizing the gym area for multiple uses is really a good point, I think. And that could be handled really well with a good schedule, but just like she talked about in the in you know in the early morning, do uh, weights and cardio and things like that. So I think we can utilize that space as a, a multi-purpose area, and that that's a great idea and and could be very very um, very good way to start. And then you start seeing, oh man, we're getting a lot of interest in 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 cardio machines and things like that. Okay. Now we have that exp expand, expanding area. I think some of the maps show an area to expand into where, okay, now we've got a good idea of where the interests lie. We can add you know, a, weight, a weight room and a cardio fitness area in this new expand, expanded area. So I think, I think those are great opportunities to see where those interests lie just by controlling that area with a schedule. And I, and I think 
you know, I mean, I, I do that with the gym here in Black Diamond and it's not rocket science, but you just kind of kind of get a feel for what times a day people are going to use that for what. And then the, the whole point that, Ma, that Manny made about safety, I think we tend to, I don't, I don't say we overlook it or diminish it, but when we're looking at this, we're saying, oh man, that's gonna be cool. We're going to go have a basketball court. We're going to have swimming, but we really need to identify with the safety aspects and all of that about, you know, the, the times that we have to spend with our families. This is a great opportunity to spend some time with our family together. Let's make sure it's a safe area and, and utilize it and um, be able to take our family there and have a good time and not be in fear of uh, what anything, you know, I mean, be able to go there and smile and have a great time and not have to worry about anything. So safety, even though sometimes it, it, it gets uh, diminished a little bit, that needs to be forefront of our, of our minds because that's what the families out there in our, in our world want to know, you know, this facility is a safe place to be with our families. So good, good input. I think I, it's really neat listening to people. And I think, I think we've hit it on the head. I think we've got what we want um, identified there. And uh, I think it's right on track. So good job. Thank you very much. Great input there. Okay. Let's Others. Do who yeah, do Rosie is Rosie. the last person with their hand up so far. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, so I actually wanted to somewhat echo what Brock said at the end of his comment there that I, I actually am really happy with how this chart looks. I think that the fives are uh, spot on in my opinion and what I've heard other community members say. Um, I'm really happy to see that the youth slash teen space was one of the fives and that that made it in there. Um, and then I also just wanted to add an echo for the indoor track as well. It seems like that um, is an amenity that our community does not currently have available anywhere. Um, so I think that that's, in my opinion, one that would, should be prioritized over um, potentially the weights and cardio because it, as others have mentioned, weights and cardio can be sort of mixed in for now until we maybe can add that in a larger facility on the, the future development phase. Um, so really, I just wanted to echo a lot of the comments and then just put a plug in that I'm really pleased to see the youth and teen space uh, prioritized in here as well. All right. Excellent. Russell, thank you. Can, Russell, if yes. I could just get one thing from a, a clarity standpoint. Um, we're, we're a planning firm that works on these projects nationwide, and we've been doing it for 30 years and we've actually operated public recreation facilities in a number of different areas in the country. Um, and I'm old enough and been involved in this that, you know, here's the history of, of where we kind of started in public recreation where we had that gymnasium space and we utilized that as truly multi-purpose and it still is today. And everybody's right, you have the ability to do a lot of things in that space, whether it's the traditional court sports or even fitness classes. And some of the boot camp classes do go in there if they're in the morning or even midday classes. Uh, but over time, what we found was, um, and, and really as an operator, what your concern is, is during your high use times. And then we found out, well, wait a minute, we can't get everything in those spaces because everybody wants to recreate at the same time. And so it point loads into certain times of the day, certain times of the year. And so that made it difficult. So that's when we started developing other spaces. So we took fitness out of the gym and put it into group fitness space so we could give them a home and give them a place that uh, where they could run the classes they needed and not impact uh, gym sports or vice versa. Same thing with weight cardio space. So I just caution you that um, while the kind of the flexibility of being able to say we can do all that stuff um, in reality is greatly diminished uh, in the ability to do that. And again, it's kind of the way the, the whole uh, facilities have evolved over time was recognizing that that only works at certain times that aren't real high use. So I don't want people to have unrealistic, really unrealistic expectations of what we might be able to do with that. Can you start with that? Absolutely within reason. If you're doing true weight and cardio space, you're either in or you're out. It, that's permanent equipment that's in there, at least permanent on a on a day to day basis. Now you can decide to take it all out at one point down the road, but you either kind of have to commit to doing it 
or not to doing it. Uh, yeah, you could add it in and do it sometime later down the road. Um, we find historically in facilities, uh, regardless of where they are in the country, the most undersized space that almost every facility operator will tell you is their weight cardio and their fitness space. And not by a little bit, but saying if we had double the space type of thing, our market would support it, even in marketplaces where there's a, a great deal of other providers. So just to provide a little context to, to all of that, and certainly we don't have to do the weight cardio. And again, we heard that mixed uh, reaction that we've been hearing tonight, but I don't know that we can effectively uh, double up on some of the things that uh, uh, maybe sounds good, but in reality is, is a little difficult to pull off. All right, so our, our next step here, looking at the, the time, uh, our next step here would be to uh, uh, have someone uh, make a motion uh, in terms of uh, taking this document, make based on all this conversation that we just had and all this feedback. So moved. Making uh, making modifications to what's shown here. Uh, so I, I'm sorry. Somebody somebody made a motion. I did, Jeff Wagner. Okay, Jeff. Thank you. Because very looking much. at the diagrams, you've also got some of the number fours already included with the fives moving forward. I don't mean to be jumping the gun. All right. Very good. So we have a the motion. We have a first and a second. Very good. Is there any further discussion before we ask for a vote? Nope. I think it's been great discussion and I mo look to move forward with it. Awesome. Well, hearing none, we'll then uh, ask uh, everyone uh, uh, to basically raise a hand in if you uh, favor uh, and support the motion as, as stated, just please raise your hand so we can take a, a good look at you. All right. Very good. Drew, have you, are you able to capture that? Sorry, I had to remove a two-year-old <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, we have it all captured anyway on the recording. Sure. So, um, so and any any opposed to the motion, please the uh, same sign. All right. Well, we will review the documentation here, but I believe we have a a, a resolution in place here to move forward with the program uh, based on the conversation we've had here. So, uh, thank you all very much for that. Uh, I'm excited for you because that kicks us to our next piece of this. Um, I'm very excited and delighted, honestly, to introduce you to uh, Kate Roosevelt. Uh, Kate is principal with uh, Campbell and Company, and I've had the pleasure of working with her firm on uh, previous projects. And uh, she's going to be your new best friend because um, what her specialty is, is in funding options, primarily on the uh, uh, the, the private side of things, uh, public funding as well, but primarily on the private side. And that's really critical as she'll explain with this. So we're gonna take about, uh, uh, Kate's gonna do a, a seven or eight minute presentation. Then uh, we do have given you a question um, from your perspective, what's the ideal funding mix for a capital project? Interesting question. So keep that in mind as you're listening to Kate uh, do her presentation and her role on this, this study. And then we'll have uh, some dialogue. So Kate, it's all yours. Thanks so much, Rustin. Let me just do a quick sound check. Can everybody hear me? Yes. I'm seeing some nods. Good. Great. Well, wonderful to be with you this evening. And uh, uh, thank you for inviting me to join you and uh, just talk a bit about uh, the work that I'll be doing or contributing, I guess, to the feasibility study going forward here. Um, as Rustin said, uh, I, I am an executive vice president with a uh, consulting firm called Campbell and Company. We have uh, offices in Seattle uh, where we've worked for over 40 years on a number of really cool, fun and important uh, community projects. And are you trying to put this in slideshow mode here or? Yeah, I was planning on it. There you go. Just, just if you just go up to slideshow on slideshow. the top, Oh yeah, there you go. In view, sure, and yeah. say from beginning, from beginning. All right, that's great. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, good old PowerPoint. Uh, <laughs> so 
over 40 years of history working with lots of really amazing community-based organizations across the Northwest. Not surprisingly, um, you know, a significant majority of the work that we've done has been in the Puget Sound region. We also have uh, about seven years ago became part of a, a national firm. So we've got uh, an office in Chicago and folks doing work also in Portland, uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, Los Angeles, uh, and the Washington, D.C. area. So you can imagine that we come into contact with a lot of visionary people like yourselves who are um, looking for ways to create uh, thriving uh, and livable communities <clears throat> uh, that benefit all of us. And it's a real pleasure for us to do to do what we do. We feel, I mean, I just feel like I have one of the best jobs in the world and uh, been doing this for over 20 years now, uh, partnering with all sorts of organizations from, you know, uh, community centers to schools to art museums and human service organizations, hospitals, uh, environmental groups, you name it, we've done it. Um, so a little bit about us, like you, we are driven by uh, our mission, and our mission is to collaborate and innovate with people who change lives through philanthropic vision and action, basically means that we work with uh, community-based organizations who are looking to uh, inspire and channel philanthropy into important uh, community projects. Uh, I think it's important for you to know that we are an employee-owned company, so we treat every client of our, ours as a firm, you know, client of the firm. Everybody has a stake in the success of our work, and we are very collaborative and team-oriented <clears throat> as, as a firm. We've got over 50 employees working uh, with clients across the country today. Uh, you can also see that we've had the good fortune to work with um, a lot of organizations over the last 40 years. Uh, and, you know, I'm happy to say that the vast majority of them have met or exceeded their goals uh, in fundraising campaigns and lots of other uh, initiatives. Um, so that's a little sense of just sort of the shape of our firm. We actually, <clears throat> if you go to the next slide, please, we'll see that um, while we uh, oops. I think we somehow we skip to the end there. <laughs> Let's see. Go, Drew. Can you go back to the um, uh, those the other slides there? I think those got hidden. Can you unhide those? Yep. There you go. Uh... <clears throat> it, it's up at the top. Hide and unhide. Sorry, I got to hide stuff because I got <laughs> things open on that side of the screen. <laughs> okay. Well, go ahead and take that slide while we unhook sure. this one. Sure. So one of the things that I like to talk to people about is that we kind of present to the world as a fundraising consulting firm, and that is really the essence of what we do. And uh, at the same time, um, we have three other uh, capabilities that we bring into our client engagements, we look at how to use data uh, to propel uh, better, bigger fundraising. That's what we call our strategic information services uh, unit. We have a communications consulting team that does communications for fundraising campaigns. So different kind of communications, really speaking to a donor audience for the purposes of motivating and inspiring their giving and support. And we also have an executive search team that uh, recruits and places talented people into um, high level executive positions in all sorts of nonprofit organizations uh, across the country. Um, so this uh, multi-service approach has served our clients well because they can kind of come to us for everything uh, and it makes their, um, you know, uh, process of engaging with consultants pretty seamless um, and, and highly uh, effective uh, at the end of the day. Um, the other thing I want to say, and a couple of you mentioned this in, in your earlier comments about the diversity, equity, and inclusion goals of your project. Um, if you could go to slide four, please, Drew, that'd be great. <clears throat> we also, and I apologize, it's a little hard to read here, read here, but basically what I want to just say to you is that as a firm, 
that is very mission driven, that is working with community based organizations across the country. We ourselves have really committed to the role of diversity, equity, inclusion, and access in the philanthropic landscape. And that means that we, you know, think about um, designing campaigns, uh, developing communications and materials, uh, uh, engaging community stakeholders in a way that many voices and perspectives are heard, and especially the voices and perspectives of the people who are most going to be most connected to the project or the uh, initiative that is moving forward. And this is, you know, a real shift in the philanthropic landscape uh, that for, you know, many years has been very kind of top down, uh, pretty paternalistic and pretty heavy handed. So we ourselves are really committed to how through our work, we can advance these goals as well um, and do our own work uh, internally to ensure that we are, um, we're, uh, you know, centering lots of different voices and perspectives in our firm as well as in our client engagement. So, um, just wanted to sh say that we share, share that these values with you. Um, so if we go to slide five, <clears throat> uh, Rustin talked a little about a bit about this question and I thought I would just wade into it and sort of introduce it. From the perspective that, you know, what I do every day is partner with and come alongside organizations, primarily nonprofit or non-governmental organizations that are looking to do something big. And those big things usually involve uh, buildings of some sort, uh, not always, but very often do. Um, you all have, you know, heard and probably participated in uh, capital campaigns for different things, whether it's your church or a school um, uh, or, you know, your whatever your favorite nonprofit organization is uh, in, um, uh, in South King County. And, you know, what I've come to realize is that there are very few of these kinds of projects that get done without them being some kind of a public-private partnership. Um, and that's important for a couple of reasons. One is that, you know, our local governments have a lot of assets that they can bring to the table in terms of property and existing facilities, um, funding strategies, funding, pots of funding, et cetera. Um, they have mandates, obviously, to deliver public benefit. And our nonprofit organizations are often in the position of looking for those assets and how they can secure those kinds of assets to deliver their mission, whether it's looking for a location uh, for a new facility, uh, looking for funding for programs that they're delivering to the community and so on. So this notion of public-private partnership is really at the heart of the work that we do uh, every day. And so when we're looking at how to put together, um, you know, a funding strategy for a project like the one that you're contemplating, we try to take a uh, maximalist point of view, meaning we try to look at every conceivable funding source that might be available for a project and then kind of winnow from there to the ones that seem most appropriate uh, and easiest to obtain in order to um, to put the funding package together for uh, for a project. It's sort of like you know putting a, a bunch of puzzle pieces. If anybody loves puzzles as much as I do, putting opening up a box of a new puzzle, putting all the pieces on the table, and then st starting to figure out which ones fit where, and um, and kind of putting putting that together. Which is also, you know, not to say that every funding source is the right funding source for every project. So um, a couple of things that, you know, are the questions that you've asked us to think about that we're beginning to dig into, obviously, are, you know, first of all, just what's the landscape of opportunity? What public and private funding sources are available or would be available for a project like this? Um, how do they play together? So there's a you know notion in fundraising and, and funding these kinds of pro projects around leverage that's really important. So sometimes, for example, when a city council is considering whether to allocate funding for a project, they'll say, well, are all of the major businesses 
in the community supportive of this? You know, are there families that have signed up to make gifts to this? And they want to know that if they're putting public resources on the table, that there are individuals and foundations and corporations that are kind of coming together with them to make, you know, add, add, uh, and make something special happen. Um, conversely, a lot of private donors, particularly when it comes to a project like this, want to know that there are, uh, you know, public funds that have, or that are, that are on the table, so to speak. And sometimes, particularly when there's, um, you know, a, a special taxing district or a bond or a levy that is kind of up before the voters will say, you know, I will make a gift that's contingent upon that funding mechanism being enacted and created. But if that doesn't happen, the project's not happening, so you don't need my gift, right? So a lot of interplay and opportunities for leveraging private and public funding sources together. Um, you know, ultimately, when it comes to the private fundraising side, and by private, again, I mean foundations, families, individuals, and corporations, you know, you've got to be able to answer the question, what will the community support? And, uh, you know, and at, at what level? And if they're being asked to, um, you know, vote on something that may uh, increase their tax bill every year and also being asked to make a donation from their checkbook or their investment fund to a project, how are they going to weigh the pros and cons of each of those asks, right? And um, we like to start from a place of assuming, you know, best intentions and that everybody wants to make something happen. But, you know, at some, at some point you have to evaluate what is the community actually willing and able to do. Um, so that feeds into this fourth question here, which is, uh, you know, it's really easy in the world of fundraising to, to make plans for spending other people's money. <laughs> and what we need to make sure we're fully aware of is, is there sufficient donor capacity and interest uh, to uh, participate in a capital campaign? It doesn't mean that you need, you know, every foundation and every donor to say yes. You just need enough people to say this is important to me, it's important to the community, and you can count on my support. So, you know, gauging uh, donor capacity and interest is a really important um, element, and there's a whole other kind of a feasibility study that happens related to that that you may or may not want to contemplate at some point in the, in the future. Um, and then uh, finally, you know, um, particularly with sort of large scale community projects, the question always comes up, are we going big enough? Like we have this opportunity to put a campaign together. We don't wanna do a campaign every, every year, every five years, even every decade. So do we have enough here to package together to present to the community that will inspire them to go big with us? Um, and that's, you know, an interesting uh, concept because I think, you know, when you look around uh, other communities, certainly in, in Washington, but around the country, there are large scale campaigns that move forward that bundle different projects, open space projects, recreation projects together. The YMCA of Greater Seattle is really good at doing this, right? They will every you know decade sort of put together the vision for the next decade of the YMCA in the, in the Puget Sound region. And they'll say, okay, we've got three or four new YMCAs that we're going to build or we're going to renovate, and they package them all together, and donors donors can, you know, give to the whole vision. They can give to a specific project if they want, um, or even within that, a specific component of a specific project. So it's important that we, you know, sort of consider this question uh, as well. If you're going to go go for it, are you going big enough, uh, is there enough in there um, to really inspire the community to get involved? Um, so I could talk about this all night long, but I know that uh, time is of the essence. So I, you know, I'm just really interested in my first uh, opportunity to, to meet with you tonight to hear your sort of thoughts and reflections on, you know, 
what you've been thinking about related to the sort of ideal funding mix for this project. When you think about, you know, just to name a few possibilities, there's uh, certainly taxpayer support in the form of, you know, creating a special taxing district or whatever we want to call it related to that. There are um, pots of funding that uh, are potentially available from the state of Washington. There are competitive grant programs and member requ requests and other ways to secure funding from, uh, from the state, state of Washington. And then of course, there's private support donations from foundations and individuals and companies, as I mentioned. And then there's also financing, right? Whether it's uh, bonding or some other form of financing to make a funding package complete. So I guess I'd just love to hear your thoughts. And of course, I'm here to answer any questions that you have about this question of how do we put the right puzzle pieces together to make this, make this possible? And what do you think based on your deep connections in this community, the community will be willing to support, you know, in the way of different asks and different opportunities to say yes to making this happen. Um, so let me just stop there and hear your thoughts and questions. Thanks, Kate. Who's got the first uh, response to our question or perhaps another question? I so see I don't a couple know hands up. Hands are the same ones as before. We have Les, <laughs> Rock, and Monty, but I don't know if they ever went down. So I have a comment, but I don't know if Brock. Great. Is. Go, Go for it, Monty. Okay, so Kate, thank you. Like, are you hiring? Because I want to jump ship for my own job. <laughs> Just kidding, you guys. I love the VA. <laughs> The reason is, okay, so here's my nerd side. I'm a recreation therapist. I develop programs for veterans with PTSD and yada, yada, yada. So this is my bread and butter. Um, can we yep. ask people for money? Heck to the yes. If we can link it to research says XYZ promotes yada, yada, yada. So the three things you had up, Rustin, with like emotional well-being, physical belt, well-being, mental well-being. Yes, there is research out there that says what we're doing directly impacts those three health domains. Health, well-being, emotional well-being, especially with and post-pandemic, it's going to be a big buzz with community organizations, what, you know, whether you want to tackle mental health organizations or physical health or what have you. Um, heck, even community organizations such as Veterans you know, Yoga Project. I mean, there are a lot of people out there who are wanting to give grants or you know, if we can link these things to data says this, we may yep. have potential biters, you know, it just depends on where we want to do. And I think, you know, you made a point of like, which way do we go? I, I think go everywhere, ask everybody, yep. private, whatever, whatever. I mean, the, the, they can say no, which is fine. But that just kind of tells us what more do we need in terms of collecting data or, or what have you. I mean, some speak to mo mostly emotional stuff and some speak to physical health. So it just depends on it. But I think as long as we're linking it to health and then values and community building, there are a multitude of ways we can just go. Monty, I love your point of view and thank you for those comments. Uh, yeah, and let me know when you wanna talk about joining our firm. Um, <laughs> and and here's, here's kind of what I take away from your comments, which is just so right on, which is that what inspires people to give to projects like this is number one, shared values. Number two, that their gift is actually creating benefit for people in the community, right? And um, number three, that they're not doing it alone, that there's a, you know, a, a, an assembly of people and sources and organizations that, that, are, that are doing this together. Um, and that all of that sort of gets wrapped into what we refer to as the case for support. And I think, you, yeah, you've put your finger on some really important points um, most especially that it's the outcomes and the values of this project that will drive giving for sure. So thank you. You know, a lot of, most people don't like to give to buildings just to create buildings. I mean, there are a few people out there that love to build buildings, but 
most donors and most foundations, they want to know, I'm helping you to build a building to do something. What is that something, right? So thank you so much for that. Brock? Yeah, um, when it comes to funding, uh, that's always a big one for everybody. Um, we Nobody wants more taxes. So yeah. if you have a combination, an attack, uh, an attack with a combination of different finance options, that becomes a lot better way to sell a project like this. Um, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna have to ask some some increase in tax for you guys, but it's a low percentage because we've got these other options that are coming in. We really did our due diligence. We found some options out there that really are gonna help us out, and it's gonna minimize the uh, in the effect on the families in our communities that becomes a great selling point. And, um, you know, everything seems to come back to us as parents and families. Um, we're gonna charge you for busing your kids to school. We're gonna take away the busings of, you know, after school pro programs. So now you have to take your kids to and from the activities. All these things start coming back to the families. And if we can, if we can potentially sell this or, or potentially uh, put together a plan to support this, and, and that input from the families is minimal, it becomes a, a, great, a great opportunity and a better selling point. And you, know, you get better uh, acceptance from the community if, if, they, if, if the money out of their pocket is minimal. And, it, and, and to show that to the people when you're, when you're selling it, that you've gone to other, other opportunities and not just said, well, we're going to build this, but you guys got to pay for it. I think I think it shows that we've done our due diligence, and and people will follow and come and and be more proactive towards it. So I think I think the more opportunity we have, the better. And your 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 group seems like we're pulling from the people that really want to want to help. So that's cool. Right on, Brock. Thank you for those comments. Well said. And yeah, I. Couldn't agree more. Thanks so much. So we can maybe take one more and then we got to spend a little bit more time on our last topic here. So any other comments? I think I see Laura's hand up. Okay. Um, yes, Laura Morrissey. And the my answer to the question is what's the, what the ideal funding source is, is it's the one that we can get. Um, and <laughs> I'm so glad Good that answer. you to be honest, this is the part of all of this that scares me the most. Like deep down, I have thought, oh, we're going to have this great plan, this great program, and we're not going to be able to build it because nobody's going to want to pay for it. So just having hung out in this community before and seen smaller projects that were went to voters fail, this is where I'm like, oh, this is the scary part. So um, I'm super glad that you're here. Uh, whatever money we can get, I think that's the right answer. <laughs> Amen to that. <laughs> That's a great comment. Well, I, I'm sorry to cut this piece short. Uh, we're, this is not your last opportunity to talk to Kate, believe me. Uh, she's just getting started. We just wanted to do an introduction and, and just start thinking about this because it's a huge piece of this, um, this feasibility study. So, um, and we're to the point now where we can kick into this. So looking forward to that next presentation, thank Kate. You. And thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody for uh, having me on board. You Thanks, bet. Kate. So last item we have here, we got about 15 minutes left. Um, the last piece is just bringing you up to speed on the, uh, the site study uh, that we've been doing. And I'm going to have Drew take you through this. Um, we'll do a sort of the flyby here. The, the, the most important takeaway from this is the, the, the point of this site analysis and our, our focus has shifted just a little bit. What we're really trying to do is learn as much as we can from each of these different sites and have those inform this final report to the level that as we move this uh, project forward from this feasibility study to the next step and the next step, it's, it's likely that you know, there won't be a one site that comes out of this study. Uh, there will be a, a recommendation, uh, but the most important thing is we need to come out with some of the basics of what you're looking for uh, as this moves forward that a, a site can give you. Uh, and Drew's going to take you through what we've done, but that's the biggest thing here is 
we're learning from all this and, and arming you for the future when when you're ready to take that next step and actually secure a site or identify a site you you have all those tools in your hands to do that so drew you want to take us through this yeah so real quick the kind of four sites that we have identified roughly within these circle areas we identified early on um, really the point of this is just to make sure that the sites that are out there are viable knowing that within the time period of moving forward, any of these sites that are currently up there could be gone by the time that it actually is funded and getting built. Um, so if for whatever reason, a site in one of these areas was deemed the best one, it might be gone um, by the time we get the funding that Kate and everyone's looking for here and everyone approves their tax increase, right? So. Um, it's really, as Rustin was saying, is to identify what are critical features within those land areas, and then also um, understanding the complexities of merging um, two communities into a singular facility. Do we have one that's more centrally located, say, in Maple Valley, or one that's more centrally located in Covington proper, or look at something in between? What are the pros and cons of those? So that's some of the pieces that we're evaluating right now. Um, also, this is where Chad comes in and what he's been working on is trying to evaluate whether or not there's any critical or sensitive lands on those sites that we need to be aware of. Um, what are site development costs um, for those different sites? Understanding those, there was a comment brought up about the parking. We've already gotten some contact info for Maple Valley on how we can look at that and make sure that we're actually doing the parking count correct for that city limits. Um, so all those become key factors in this um, discussion here. And then originally we had the site considerations matrix and I won't go through all of this. Um, this has even been updated because we've learned different information about site C um, and B that changed some of the scoring in these. So this is kind of a living document. It still shows that sites A and F were the two highest ranked, but these two sites are right in the middle and they have their pros and cons each way. Currently site C is a little better than site B, but not by much. Um, so I guess the biggest takeaway on this is that there's four viable sites within your two cities which is a great starting point because it's better to have some options than to have no options. So, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, jump back in. Uh, yep. Drew's, Drew's right on point here. What I wanna do is spend the last 10 minutes uh, hearing from you. Um, we do have, we have viable sites and that's a big part of our feasibility study is, well, it's not feasible if there's no place to put it. Uh, the good news is we do have uh, uh, viable options here and over time there will likely be more. So want to get back to the question that we posed you in the agenda, which was given the various types of sites and the fucking uh, funding mechanisms that we uh, were just hearing about from Kate. Share what you think would be ideal and the best fit for our community. So what what are your thoughts on everything that we've shown you so far on, on potential sites? And really at any level, we'd love to hear from you uh, on what you would prioritize as this is why I would choose a site. So who's got the first comment? I think Brock has his hand up first, then Laura, and then Les. I think my hand keeps going up because I don't take it down. <laughs> but, so it's a good but strategy. I think, <laughs> but I think um, if if I'm a community member from Maple Valley or or Covington, and I'm helping to fund this, I I shoot for something that's a little bit more central to both, like C and B. And it doesn't, it, the, the travel time isn't that big a deal because it isn't that far from A to F, but the ownership becomes, it's more ours if it's closer to both rather than it seems like it's more Covington because it's in Covington's area or it's more Maple Valley. So, you know, I'm supporting it. I want it to be, you know, part of my area. I want it to be in my area. So 
from my standpoint, it'd be better to have it in a central area and C and B would be better than A and F for that reason only. All right. Great. Uh, that's very succinct. Thank you for that. Other, other comments? So I had a similar thought as Brock um, in that the, I like how you added the neutral location criteria. And since we are dealing with two different communities, each kind of with their own sense of identity, um, this idea of potentially locating the site literally on the border between the two of them is attractive for the same reason that Brock said, this idea of ownership. Um, I've heard my friends in Maple Valley say, well, it needs to be in Maple Valley. And my friends in Covington say, well, everything's in Maple Valley. They get whatever they want. And so to be able to place it like right in the middle, kind of it means it belongs to everybody. Now, having said that, right in the middle might not be the best site overall. And so I think that that's just something to be aware of, that there might be a, a small little prejudice wall that we might need to scale when it does come time to site, if we have to site at A or at F. Um, but the idea of placing it in the middle between the two cities is uh, very wise, I think. All right, great, thank you. Who's next? Les, then Rosie, and then Jeff. Yeah, this is Les, and I, I, I concur with everyone else there. Uh, I would prefer site C and B, you know, uh, if, if there is not something that would throw them out down the road because of, um, you know, other considerations. But I, I like the idea of something in the middle, and, and the, the travel time from um, Maple Valley Highway uh, on 160, uh, excuse me, on um, 516, on Kent Kangley to, uh, through Covington can sometimes be, especially on Saturdays, can be crazy. Uh, it can be 20 minutes uh, to get, you know, that distance. And it's a very short distance. So uh, yeah, I, I think something dead in the middle, uh, C and B makes more sense. All right. Great, Les, thank you. Others that maybe have a, a, a different view of this? Rosie or Jeff, you guys can chime in. Sure, I'll go ahead. Um, I am looking at the ownership um, point here. It, am I correct in assuming that if, it, if it's marked client owned, um, that wouldn't necessarily be an additional cost for the project to purchase the land itself, or is that an incorrect assumption? Um, some of that might be an incorrect, and that's also, um, I realized after we had sent this out that that's actually needing some revision on those. So um, some of those aren't necessarily client. Um, it's more of a public-private um, designation, so... Gotcha. Okay. Um, I, so I live in Maple Valley and so site A, you know, smack dab in the middle of Covington uh, would potentially be a little bit of a, a drive with traffic, but um, I, I like the fact that site A in particular seems to have um, the best, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it seems to be well suited for this development already. It has it looks like a lot of the utilities are ready. It has the access. Um, and so I think from a like cost standpoint, I think trying to find one that we maybe wouldn't have to purchase the land and maybe would have a little bit of those up, a little bit less of those upfront development costs uh, might be helpful, especially since, you know, we're trying to cram a lot of stuff into this center to get everything that we want. It would be nice if we could save a little bit money on the site itself um, and put that towards programming. Thank you, Rosie. Right. Great, thank you. So my concerns, um, everything everybody said is, I like that idea. My main concerns are access by major roads, but looking at things like environmental concerns, earth and, earthwork and grading requirement, stormwater management, um, that's a lot of cost up front. And if we can get around having to use that, Whereas a couple of sites are already 
ready to go without having those major concerns. Um, I look at that because that can tend like looking at possible wetlands. Well, that's a lot of possible high costs to develop the land. Absolutely right. Yep. All right. I think we got time for a couple more and then we'll wrap up. Any uh, other Chris, comments? Chris, Chris just raised his hand and then Marita. Okay. Yeah, I was just gonna make one comment. Um, I, as we went through the the findings of what's available <clears throat> in the area, one of the things that popped was that neither uh, Kent nor Tahoma School District swim teams have a facility. Um, so when we talk about location, I think having potentially, if they're going to be a main user of the competition lanes, you know, how do the schools fall into, you know, locations as well and access for those students coming right after school to use the pool for buses to get to those locations. I didn't see that called out as something here because I think our access uh, criteria is more general, but I think we do have a couple specific user cases we may want to look at that are specific to certain types of users. Perfect. Well, we do have one more slide we want to show you here really quick. Uh, we have been doing some really basic massing studies just to start landing this program on some of these sites. Drew, can you just do that really quick? It'll just take a minute, which is about all we have left. So. Yep. And if Maria, if you want to pull, talk while I'm doing that, uh, feel free to bring right. up the point. Um, I, I can appreciate everybody's comments about C and B. Um, my question is, is it, is it easy enough for you guys to articulate if we went with site A, which to me, just looking at the scores, looks like it scored so much higher. Um, if we went with C or B because of the benefit of being in the middle, what would we, what are the major things we'd be losing out of site A, from site A? Is it easy for you guys to articulate that? Um, sorry, can you repeat that? So, that was <laughs> Since we had several comments about BNC, you know, being ideal because of its location in the middle, if we de decided to go with one of those, what would we be losing that we would have gotten in site A? Is it easy? I know we have all these scores, but I was wondering if it was easy for you guys to pick a few of the most important, the big things out that we'd be losing in site A if we went with site B and C. Um, Is that too hard of a question? Real easy things that people or that you would be losing as much as um, it's some of the kind of development costs, which some of that info is costs. Even, okay. even as we're. Um, what I'm gonna suggest is uh, it's a great question that we need to give you a, a, a better answer on than we can do here. Uh, let us follow up with you on that because that's a very good question. And I think that applies to a lot of the feedback we've gotten from others. So okay. uh, let us work that uh, because that's a, that's a very good question to ask. Um, and get answered. So uh, we will do that. Drew, any luck with the images or? Yep, I'm a train. There we go. So these are very, very early uh, concept diagrams. We're showing this to, to just to give you an idea of some of the modeling that we're going to start doing uh, that we've already started doing on some of these sites. We're trying to keep this very, very conceptual. These should not ever feel like solutions. They're not. They're just indications and tools in a study that starts to give you an idea of what this might start to look and feel like. And again, we're talking about buzz here. We're trying, trying to get people excited. And by the time this virtual public workshop comes up, this is the kind of sizzle that we need. And as long as it's got a solid foundation based on really good process, is reflective of the community and all the, the potential partnerships and stakeholders and all of that. These are the kind of things that we can start getting people excited with. And uh, so these are still under development. We'll be doing a lot more work with these as uh, we continue to work this, but we just want to get those in front of you. And uh, I'm sorry they were not in the packet. We were still working on them and we're still working on them. And uh, they're going to get a lot better uh, even than these. But these are just some of the initial tools that we like to use for planning and just informing people, well, what might it look and feel like? Uh, it's something like this. So, and so I think with, really it's the Rustin, state correct state me if I'm wrong, those will be highlighted at the uh, workshop on the 20th. They will, exactly right. So, 
So with that, it's 8.32. Uh, we've had you for two and a half hours. And uh, I just want to take the quick moment to say thank you. Uh, what great feedback we've gotten tonight. And I'm not just saying that. Uh, I don't do that. Uh, this is great, substantive feedback uh, that we need to move this forward with. And uh, we're looking forward to that next meeting, uh, uh, bringing the public in and, and taking their feedback and, and getting responses to them. And then the final wrap up with all of you on uh, the rest of the findings on uh, the work that's being done. So thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure working with truly engaged uh, people such as yourselves. Um, and uh, with that, uh, Matthew, anything else? Thank you very much, Preston, no. Perfect, well, we will sign off and uh, we'll get back to you with some of the, the information here. We'll get notes out as quickly as we can on, on the discussion. and. Have a great evening and thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks.